Alrighty. Vogelfrei. That's right. Uh, All right. I'll switch over to you directly. And we're actually on time, so it's perfect. Okay. So it's no stress. Okay. So, Thank you, Vogelfrei. Thanks. So uh, what I'm presenting today, I don't know how many of you are uh, ham radio operators who have, uh, you can raise your hands. Just wonder. Okay. So that's not many people of all of you. So I'm presenting something related to APRS. It's a protocol uh, in ham radio. Uh, let's say that you too. Okay. Uh, about myself, I honestly don't think it's important to you know, talk to talk too much about uh, you know yourself. But uh, I do completely unrelated work. But I took like a sabbatical, and it turned into maybe. 1.5 years doing completely unrelated things with uh, radio frequency, teaching myself uh, things about uh, transmission of uh, mostly data in a way that can be uh, done in urban environments with a lot of noise. So I'm interested in weak signal protocols and things like that. And APRS, um, as we will see now, it's interesting because it's mostly decentralized, and it has a very solid infrastructure uh, already existent that you can use to do all kinds of things. Uh, it was developed by this guy called Bob Bruninga when he was in Japan. He was from working for the US Navy. And he wanted to have a tactical system for position reporting, uh, or status, or anything that told uh, other people that were in nearby, like within a radius of uh, coverage from uh, different transmitters, uh, what's going on? So uh, I will ask to take with a grain of salt what a tactical means, because many, especially ham radio tactical, usually it just means that you're paying more money for something that is not tactical or anything like that. And we, we will see why it's not exactly uh, panacea or anything like that. It's, it's Definitely not something you would use much in a military setting. Uh, it's very uh, exposed to, uh, uh, let's say, trivial electronic warfare tactics. Um, but um, the most important thing is uh, it's stateless. So I imagine it's something like UDP over radio frequency. Uh, there is absolutely no information kept within packets. There's no assumption that you're going to get a response for your packet. You just broadcast something, someone gets the packet, decodes that, and then uh, chooses what to do with it. But there is no mm, persistent link between uh, two given machines or uh, transmitters operating. It's working on top of X25. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, uh, if you've read about satellite communications with ham radio satellites or very old AmperNet stuff. Uh, it's basically that. Um, so one of the things that I was talking about is that it's a single channel. Uh, there is no frequency hopping. Uh, frequency hopping is that you change frequency uh, uh, during a given time. You can maybe thousands of times per second, uh, one time per second. You change your frequency so that, uh, let's say, uh, an adversary cannot jam your transmission on a single channel and completely uh, deter, deter you from using that. Uh, one example of that will be Swedish uh, military radios, like Vintage, older ones. They were programmed for BHF, and they had like 12 channels. Many, um, I don't know if uh, people here have a background in the military in Sweden. Uh, but I guess if you're old enough, you've probably seen them. I think they were 12 channels and they were BHF. Uh, the thing is, if you have something that is pre-programmed and those channels are pre-programmed, you don't even need to, to have uh, uh, wideband jamming capabilities. You just have to need a, a jammer on each of those channels and then it's killed. You cannot use those field radios at all. So <coughs> with uh, APRS, it's basically the same thing. It's, um, Lots of radio operators using it, thousands of people, and a very stable internet infrastructure that we're going to see uh, later during the talk. But uh, it's extremely susceptible to abuse. So that brings us to uh, one concept very important in ham radio, and it's most things in ham radio are based on a 
mutual assumption of good faith, meaning that you're not going to be an asshole. So if you're transmitting something, which is what we are going to see later, uh, you're not going to overlap other people, you're not going to uh, jam the transmissions, you're not going to spoof other people, but the problem is there is no uh, authority controlling what's going on, there is no, I mean, authority in the sense of uh, at a technical level, like the protocol is not enforced that way. You, you can impersonate anybody, you can uh, pretty much transmit whatever you want, and all that limits you is the implementations of the uh, modems and the software that is connected and all that. Um, APR is very cheap to implement in the MCUs, we will see it's ASCII, so imagine if you go back to uh, the 90s, uh, and that's one thing also about ham radio that you may notice if you delve deeper into it. It's uh, it's like going in a time capsule back to the times when you had uh, DL app and you know GeoCities was the thing, and everyone had this personal page and everything looked like crap. But basically, it's like that, and it, the code can look kind of uh, obscene sometimes. It's not up to the standards generally that you will expect in. Uh, in network exposed uh, software these days, even if you see completely stupid mistakes being done all the time. But uh, this is what the X25 frame looks like. Uh, you're going to notice two things mostly. The destination address and search address. They are called station IDs, like a seed, like if you were in Wi-Fi. Whenever we say station ID, it's a call sign. And a call sign is assigned to you by basically the government when you get a radio license. So it's in native alphabet, so you can be Echo Alpha 4, Gold Radio Tango, whatever you get. Uh, usually you can get a vanity call sign. They don't allow uh, call signs that are offensive, so you cannot get uh, Echo Alpha 4 Gay or Echo Alpha 4 Gram or Echo Alpha 4 whatever. I mean, anything that they think is not politically correct, they don't let you have it. Um, so that's not enforced at all, it's just you basically mm, encode your packet, uh, modulate it in FM or uh, SSB or whatever you're using with your uh, sound modem or uh, your physical uh, TNC, your uh, terminal node controller, which is just basically uh, software modem implemented in hardware. And uh, you have the control field, the UI that is static for APRS, and then you have the information field, which is what contains the APRS data, and that's a maximum of, uh, technically it's 255, and if you notice, it's uh, just one single, one byte integer, which is what you're limited to, but in practice, packets are much smaller than that. This is what an APRS packet looks like. Basically, you have a data type ID, it's one single character, it's, all of this is ASCII, you can process it in a terminal, it's all text. There is no binary, uh, especially because it cannot be encoded efficiently. It needs to be uh, transformed into a encoding that is uh, efficient when it's transmitted over a radio frequency link. And uh, this is using AF ski modulation. It's audio frequency shift keying. If you were using other types of modulation, then uh, you have higher baud rates, you have higher speed, but uh, it's completely different, it's more subject to, you need to have spatial, um, let's say, hardware for that, you need to, sp the mod has to be uh, specifically developed for that. Uh, audio frequency key is just over audio frequencies, which means you can plug it on a phone, you can plug it on a handheld radio, um, basically all those things. Uh, something like this, which uh, it's, 30 bucks, 40 bucks, it's China made, but it's reasonably uh, reliable. Uh, it's a very popular brand. Uh, if you've seen uh, press releases about ISIS or stuff like that, they often have these radios because they're dirt cheap. Um, what interests most is uh, the comment and the APRS data. The data that we will see soon. So that's what well, a message looks like. You're gonna notice the no call, that's not a, a non-existent uh, station ID that you will use for testing. Uh, you will 
you will notice that there is a source and a destination. No call and N1 call. The 9 is a symbol. It just means that you're mobile or whatever. You can pick different symbols indicating uh, what kind of... Let's say you can have different transmitters under your same ID. So you can have one at home and then you can have one with your mobile and things like that. Uh, the white 2 and 2, um, we'll get to that, but it's, uh, uh, it's basically... Uh, um, Congestion, contro uh, congestion control is not, not so much of a congestion control at all because you're sharing the, the channel with everybody and everybody can overlap your transmission. But what it does, it prevents you from abusing the system so that one node will not relay uh, your packet across a limited number of nodes. Be precisely because it's a single channel and that means that if you transmit at the same time someone else is transmitting, most likely the packet will not decode properly. So you don't get your signal across, you don't get your packet across, the other person doesn't get his either. So it's, um, let's say, mutually, mutual failure situation. And that's what it tries to prevent. In reality, it doesn't work that well. Uh, it limits mostly, let's say, if you misbehave to a local area, uh, the line number in this case, this is not too relevant, but for a message, uh, it just helps the recipient display the message. Uh, the message test can be any ASCII text, so you can already encode or uh, use crypto in that just fine, but that's going to be visible. You're going to see it in your radio or your software that is connected to this, and it's going to be very obvious. So about the demo, uh, I asked them about playing what APRS sounds like. It's annoying, and maybe it's best not to play loud through the speakers. So I'm going to try to... <coughs> Let's see if he plays... So I'm kind of glad that we didn't play that through loudspeakers. Uh, okay, let's go back to... There we go. You can use an RTL SDR, it's not an SDR. Well, technically it is, but uh, let's say a uh, um, TVS stick that I'm sure many people, many among you have probably seen it. And uh, it's very cheap, it's like $7, and you can get your feet wet with... Uh, uh, radio frequency stuff at, uh, let's say, more or less uh, novice level without spending much money. Now we're going to get to the interesting bits, because, uh, of, of course, if you have just a bunch of uh, old men uh, exchanging messages among each other with, uh, I don't know, some guy from Kansas they're never going to meet in their lives, it's not so interesting. But what's interesting is if you have these nodes connected to each other through the Internet, and most importantly, is if you have a relay Imagine like in the 90s or even earlier when uh, SMTP was open and people really were running open relays so you could do all kinds of things with SMTP. You could even uh, abuse SMTP as uh, the centralized storage mechanism. You could use the bounce messages to store information as a kind of cover channel, things like that. Um, it's pretty much back to the 90s with this. You're assumed to behave properly all the time, not to do anything you're not supposed to. And, uh, well, of course, it's the human element, so let's look what we have available. So one of the things that uh, Internet gateways do is they bridge the radio frequency link with the Internet. And uh, what, that, uh, what that means is that you get an Internet-connected terminal that will relay, will output your packet to a, the radio frequency spectrum uh, in its range from any location you're in the world, probably you have a valid or validating call sign and a passcode. The passcode algorithm is public, so you can generate a passcode for anybody. You could spoof anyone. Um, you can select which uh, gateway you want to to use for relaying your packet. Uh, when I say not truly, not not truly decentralized, it's because they're main servers. So. They could tackle on this, but it will take a massive, uh, let's say, restructuring of the of the system, especially 
when you have old, older people and uh, something that is 20 years old maybe or uh, changing it, it's very, very difficult. So tackling uh, abuse in this case, it will not be so easy, but it's still within the, 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 the realm of possibility of more uh, technically capable uh, administrators of this of these gateways. Um, the different uh, gateway software available. Uh, the original was a Java implementation. That is not publicly available. You have to ask the author to send it to you. And uh, it has some interesting quirks, but it's Java, which means it's uh, very disgusting to look at. So um, APRSD is written by this uh, Finnish guy. It's um, actually really clean. It's in C. And uh, he wrote it because the Java renal was um, obscene and uh, underperforming. So he couldn't. He needed like a dual C on server to run that stuff. And he's running the, the C version on a Raspberry Pi for handling all the traffic in Finland. Uh, Direwolf is a soft modem. Soft modem is basically you're modulating or uh, processing the signals you're doing DSP in software. And uh, it lets you have access to the APRS protocol, uh, send packets, decode packets, connect to uh, other gateways and things like that, and report back to the, to the network. Uh, restrictions apply to packets. Uh, you cannot, for instance, send a packet that is meant f both for an internet gateway and the RF link. You have to uh, send the destination address to the uh, target call center, which could be a guy that you have driving in some uh, backwater town in the US, while you're located anywhere else in the world with internet connectivity. And uh, the network is going to figure it out. The network is going to find the white path until it becomes zero. And it's going to find a way to, to get your message across that. If there is a gateway within range available, and possibly that has heard his uh, call sign or ID uh, within a given uh, timeout. I think may it depends on, on, on the configuration, but it could be maybe 60 minutes, stuff like that. So uh, there are some restrictions. The only way to know them is to audit the code. So it's back to hacking just like with anything else. It's just checking what you can get away with. Services using APRS, uh, well, the uh, IS uh, internet infrastructure is uh, quite big. APRS.5, if, if you put it on your browser now and you check it, you're going to see uh, row packets of the network is processing and all that. Um, basically, it lets you able people. You can follow people who have a radio in their car and are willingly transmitting uh, where they go with their car, what they do when they stop. Uh, if they go on mot uh, motorcycling, like, uh, or uh, sorry, um, uh, they take uh, whatever, a bike or anything like that, they go hiking and they have a mobile unit, a handheld with APRS, you can see where they go. You can see the speeds, you can see the altitude, you can see all kinds of things. Most of these are connected with GPS and the protocol is very tightly knit, uh, very tightly coupled with uh, uh, position tracking. Uh, and uh, GPS is freely available. So you can do all kinds of stuff. I mean, you can even, if you want to mess with somebody, you could check, for instance, if they're, uh, they're respecting the speed limits. You could check every, every road they've been to and correlate that with the speed limits. Or just check with their houses or uh, family or whatever. But anyhow, my point is it's huge. There's thousands of nodes. Uh, the traffic mm, for a protocol like this is almost in the range of a megabit per second. And that's, if you consider what the protocol actually is, uh, that's a pretty high rate. Uh, let's connect to the... So reversing the one of the applets that is used for, um, uh, for connecting to, uh, to see what iGates are available, uh, basically... <coughs> internet right now. So we're going to skip that for now. I'm uh, not sure if we have accessible and I cannot use my phone right now. Uh, okay, so 
what you can do is connect to aprs.fi and if you Google up um, aprs-is and uh, you look for available iGates, you're going to find a page, I think it's uh, aprs chew.net or something like that, you're going to see the applet. Of course, you need Java, but if you reverse the applet, uh, you're going to find a special username, which does not use a passcode, and if you use that username to log in and you use a filter, because you're going to specify a filter and you connect to these servers to only get the packets that you're interested on, you can get only iGates, only the nodes that are existing sending position reports, and mostly uh, the packets are sent by this, uh, these nodes because their eye gates is only position reports. So you can see the latitude, longitude, you can see where they are located in the map. Um, one of the things I wanted to look at is handling of spatial packets. Um, this is the, uh, let's say, the core parsing function of APRSC. Um, that's the user defined and third party packets. They are basically packet in packet definitions. Uh, the, the main difference is that user defined lets you do anything. Uh, you can uh, put whatever you want in the APRS body. Uh, a third party is basically the same, but it has um, more restrictions. You cannot, for instance, put any path you want in it. You have to have a valid path nested inside the message in the header. And uh, every implementation may have some restrictions on what to do with that. Uh, depending on, on the implementation, uh, they require you to have uh, some uh, conditions met. Uh, for instance, in the path has to contain a specific uh, a spatial call signs. They are not real call signs, but they are elements that tell uh, the network how it needs to route that packet through different I gates. Uh, in the case of third party, you only the only real way to find out is to read the implementations or reverse engineer them. Uh, in this case, we're going to see that it's fairly permissive. So they only check if the path is valid, if the call signs look OK. Uh, the call signs is basically alphanumeric, usually uh, two literal letters and then one number and then the rest letters up to six maximum with a dash and a ID that it represents what I was talking about, mobile, it could be one, two, three, Mo nine is usually for mobile, so that's pretty much it, and you can get, uh, you can get away with this, you can already do that. The, the problem with this, and we will see, is that it's very obvious, so we will look into other possibilities that the protocol allows you to do that. Uh, some precautions. Do not test on the air. Um, pretty much in every place in the world, it's illegal to transmit, in, uh, obsc let's say, obscured or encoded or uh, encrypted communications. Even if you have a ham radio license, you cannot transmit anything encrypted. The only one with the uh, privilege to do that is the government. So uh, if you do transmit something, you have to make sure that your keys are either published or not do it at all. So this should not be tested on the air. Uh, the band police, band police, mm, it's literally in most countries they call, uh, Finland they call them band policy. Uh, in Russia it's pretty much the same. It just, because amateur radio is basically on a uh, assumption of good faith, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the operators are actually enforcing the rules. So if they see people misbehaving, it's usually uh, self-contained. And the response may even be physical. I mean, they may go to your house or they may do something to your uh, transmission lines. They may cut your, throw down your antenna, whatever. Uh, but, or they can report you to the, uh, to the uh, th communications authority. If they do that, you can get a very hefty fine. So what can be done? <coughs> You have internet connected transmitters, and these transmitters are willingly and uh, openly relaying uh, mostly everything you send them, provided that it looks somewhat valid. You can proxy, you can uh, use onion routing, you can use multiple layers of, of routing, you can use Tor as an exit, but meanwhile, you could be routing through different uh, pivots, so you can mask uh, the source of your. Uh, communications over the internet until the point where it reaches the uh, radio frequency uh, end of things. So with this, you could be s yeah, sitting here and uh, send a packet to the network 
to a specific call sign that does not need to exist and get it relayed to someone who is maybe driving or n without internet connectivity, just uh, in a house or um, a car, a vehicle, whatever. Anywhere in the world, there's coverage. So uh, things that you could do too is if you want to have, uh, let's say, Command and control network for other things, for in, uh, things that are occurring only in, in, in the internet. Even if, say you have compromised something and you need a communication layer to uh, isolate yourself from, uh, from let's say, a, a higher layer of, of, of control of those things. If you want to, uh, let's say, communicate with that network without um, revealing or using any pre existent uh, or impossibly. Uh, tapped or surveyed or uh, being watched uh, channels, you could use this. You could just set up your own iGate, uh, even with, you could get your license, set it, and you could be using this for uh, relaying information, pretty much anything that your imagination can do with this. You got transmitters connected to the internet and they will openly do whatever you ask them to, probably that it's not completely out of the spec. So. Abusing data type identifiers. Um, as I said before in the beginning, it's a packet type is one character. Uh, you're probably going to recognize the characters uh, from X here. You're going to see uh, uh, quotes, you're going to see dashes, stuff like that. You're going to see uh, uh, just, uh, it's an ASCII table, really. It's, and uh, it, it's predetermined so that uh, ranges are reserved. Some of them are already in use. But uh, for instance, space weather. I mean, well, what is it? going to be used for. Uh, right now it's not really, as far as I know, used for anything. If you transmit with these identifiers, it's very easy to detect. Um, it can be detected just by processing the header. You, they don't need to do any, any inspection of what's actually inside the packet. Just one character and that's already uh, given up. So the obvious. Uh, the third party and user defined packets. What's interesting about them is that while the uh, internet infrastructure uh, the, uh, will readily, if not expose you right away, because oh, it's very obvious, you can actually see that uh, the gateways are passing the messages, but if you connect to APRS.5 and you see the raw packets, it's going to show up as unsupported packet format. So that's already uh, a red flag. And of course, people may be looking into that. But what's interesting is that uh, radios have built-in modems uh, decoding APRS, and some of these TNCs, they don't show you anything. So it will not be immediately obvious to people in your vicinity, in the uh, radio frequency end of things. People that are just using the radios, they may not see these packets going on. And that's the description of the third party. Uh, Basically, it says what I was talking about, about the path, and it says, okay, you can put anything so as long as the repeating path is sane. So, a uh, very simple, trivial example, uh, using user defined and third-party packets. Uh, if you notice the uh, left bracket <coughs> in the beginning, it's the only common, uh, it's the only constant in, the, in those packets. Uh, it's just Rindial, it's just the uh, AES uh, CBC with a uh, padding. Uh, you probably don't want to roll your own crypto, you probably want to rely on things so that uh, you don't, let's say, make very obvious mistakes. Um, but in reality, you could get away with using the string cipher and just uh, avoid all the complexity of using padding and because it, it it's going to make your packets constant size sometimes or uh, you're going to have to implement some tricks to, to make it a little bit more flexible and just plain, uh, simple, stupid uh, stream cipher and nothing else. Uh, the simple exercise here, we can just check here. a little bit cut to the left. So, uh, 
they're going to see the white path in the beginning all the way in the top a magic that is uh, only used because the pre-share key will decrypt the packet so you can check that you're actually decrypting something that is saying that is uh, an actual packet that was sent and uh, you don't want to have anything that can be identified in the packet you don't want to have magic values or anything like that but uh, as an exercise this is all cool and dandy and uh, it's trivial to implement but uh, in reality, it's very easy to detect. Very easy. So, how about cover channels in normal packets? What you usually, if you want a cover channel, is you try to find loopholes in the specification, things like uh, conditions that m the, uh, the developers of the implementations may have screw up. Like um, they may check for a condition and then. Uh, require a specific field in the format that needs to be uh, present but another field might be in use if something is containing that field then you can use a tiny bit of space in those fields that uh, happen to be unused by some implementation that's one way to go about it it's implementation dependent so you, um, you may cause problems you may actually expose uh, bugs in the implementations, things breaking, uh, especially because it's all a string manipulation just like it was done in the 90s, so if you actually go into the code I'm gonna show <coughs> just an example of what it looks like This is a very popular sort of modem. Okay, uh, just uh, check that out. Uh, just uh, that's just the debugging, but just to get an idea of what it looks like, it's like you're back to the 90s with the WBUFTPD format string box and uh, string. Uh, just try that string copy, uh, stack based buffer overflows, and just. In this function, there is nothing going on, really. I mean, there is no present bug that I recall, but um, it gives you an idea of what's going on. Every I mean, if it looks like that and it's done like that everywhere else, there's bound to be things. And there are, but back to the techniques. Um, there's something, uh, Axe 25 does an interesting trick. Um, uh, when, the, when the binary data is sent contains, uh, I believe, if I recall correctly, it was... Uh, five sequential series, it sends one. Uh, and uh, the, the recipient is uh, responsible for decoding that properly. So I haven't investigated that thoroughly, but it might be possible to use that. Uh, just like, um, and I, I hope you really like the talk that's coming next, because it's really interesting work that they've done, so, uh, Travis and Sergey. Um, error correction is also typically abused for cover channels. Because the, the errors that you can inject are intentional. So uh, normal uh, listeners will uh, basically ignore them, but people who are on the lookout for those specific, let's say, fake errors will actually be called what you're sending. So that's one way to go about it. Uh, one important thing is don't crush uh, <laughs> suspecting listeners and the gateway software. If you do, of course people are going to look into it. So uh, the padding comment on the news field is what I was talking about, and we will see now. Telemetry extensions. Uh, this is an upgrade to a format it's called a Mike E. Uh, Mike E, uh, this is pretty much 15, 20 years old stuff. Um, what this sends is telemetry data. This long, uh, you can send uh, values uh, from an ADC, like a voltage that is being read from some industrial uh, interface to something. Any, any data you can think of is usually very basic and arcane, like integers in uh, basic comments, uh, position. That's uh, that's what the Mike E format is used for. But they included, uh, between 2010 and 2012, base 91 encoded binary data in it. So here's the telemetry extensions. Uh, the one in red is the, is the DTI, is the identifier for a packet type. Uh, the position in the first one is encoded with base uh, 91, but um, you may actually be confused because uh, the encoding of the of the APRS protocol is very interesting in the sense that uh, they specify 
how to encode longitude, latitude, and other data uh, using letters, and it may look like special encoding, but those are actually fixed. Like, uh, you have to respect that or uh, the decoding will be completely uh, mistaken. Uh, that's not base 19 on the first. The TLR, uh, the TLM uh, part of the packet, it is base 91 encoded. So you get about four, uh, four beats usually in, in those packets that you can reuse for whatever you want, or you can just use the whole comment in base 91. And they will willingly uh, relay this, no problem. And it will look and decode like a normal packet. So that's pretty much it. Um, so the specification is really long. Uh, there's lots of things. I'm sure I've missed plenty of things. Um, uh, besides the telemetry extensions, you also have ways to potentially abuse, but that's again implementation depending, uh, position ambiguity, meaning that uh, if you're not sending the coordinates with Bailey data, like all zeros, they're going to start cutting the precision of the location. It's used for privacy, because like I said, you could connect to the internet and watch where people are going, uh, so maybe you don't want people to track you, so position ambiguity, what it does is, it, it degrades the precision of the GPS tracking, uh, the, the uh, position information to, uh, let's say, progressively uh, bigger um, grids in the map. So if you change the most significant part of the coordinate, let's say you get a range of several, uh, several dozen feet, if you go up, it's going to be a couple hundred, then it's going to be a kilometer, 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers, stuff like that. You could have used that for including your own data. Uh, if you want to find loopholes and wish to abuse that, you just read the implementation. Don't trust the specification uh, like a textbook. It's uh, The developer at the end of the day is the one who's uh, trying to uh, transform it into something functional and he, he's human and he's going to screw up or he's going to be lazy and try to avoid some things like decoding overly complex sequences or whatever. Um, one thing that you uh, should keep in mind if you're testing uh, any kind of covered channels in uh, radio protocols, it's two things. One is direction finding, and the other one is fingerprinting of your uh, transmitter. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but basically it means someone can find where you're transmitting from, and they can also uh, let's say, very precisely figure out um, what, your, uh, what your maker and model of the transmitter is. You, you, could, you could tell w within a very close range that uh, you're using this radio to transmit that. If you're messing with people, and you're, they, they could change the modulation, they could uh, change the waveform, um, the harmonics too, because every radio may have different properties. Uh, so, for instance, um, Chinese radios are very sensitive and very... Uh, they're not very selective, but they're very sensitive, meaning that you, you can copy signals that are uh, very low in, let's say, 0.2 millivolts, uh, which is uh, reasonably reasonably low for something that costs like $30 or 40 But they're not very selective, and they're not very selective also on the output, meaning that if you check the spectrum, you're going to see that there are harmonics of your, of your uh, transmission. There's going to be a, an a upper frequencies they are basically your sense signal, but attenuated. And that can be used to, to uh, figure out uh, who is who. Um, reuse likelihood of detection by means of frequency hopping and avoiding predictable. This is useless on APRS if you're going to take advantage of the system infrastructure. But if you're rolling your own, AFSCI is not very useful for that because uh, commercial solutions, they can actually track frequency hopping in the range of 2,000 per second. So some several tens of thousands of euros uh, interception solution from a German company. Um, that I wasn't told the name because a friend was kind of sharing that with me in a confidence. So I don't know, and I didn't ask, but uh, basically getting some of the specifications for actual uh, government use or uh, military use uh, hardware is it gives you a, a sense of reality. Like, um, 
uh, you have to get much more sophisticated to actually avoid the the loopholes of being detected and also easily being tracked with that. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I mean, just uh, rely on cheap equipment if you're going to do anything that you're not supposed to and uh, have fun. Yeah, just. So what did I do? Um, I took Direwolf, even if it was kind of, I mean, the guy makes a huge effort, and one of the things that he has the best, the modulator for X25 uh, available in an open source implementation. It's really good. It's based on a uh, QEX, uh, which is the only peer review magazine in uh, ham radio. Uh, the modulator for X25, and it's really good. I mean, it, it can decode packets that other, other modems would basically struggle with. Um, uh, a new asynchronous Python library. Basically, I want to have speed when connecting to the to the internet infrastructure that is available. Uh, how are interfaces? I build one, but I spend until the night to get that done. Unfortunately, it uh, failed because it was made with junk ports, like some 4 a.m. I haven't slept since yesterday, and that's the reason that um, I cannot make a full demo with that. About uh, the soft modem. It's based on Direwolf. I already talked about it. Probably going to be rewritten eventually completely and not use the, the renal code base except for the modulator. And all it does is just decode the packets from the from sound and apply, a, let's say, uh, the basic level of transformation so you can. Uh, uh, some of the, the tricks I implemented uh, that you can you pass di them directly to existing APRS software so it's transparent. And that's the library, just uh, nothing complex, just using Twista for uh, the network inside, and it's object-oriented, so there's a lot of inheritance, so I can implement new packet formats easily. Maybe open source, I have still to clean up code and uh, do a bunch of things with it. And I, feel, I think I'm over the limit already, and um, if you have any questions, I'm wondering if I could actually yeah, I'm going yeah. to say thank you, Fogelfry. Uh, we're slightly over time, but I think maybe we take questions uh, in the break. Yeah. To, so we don't uh, overrun yeah. the schedule too much. Yeah. But thank you very much. Okay. And it's a whole can of worms. It, it feels like.